sermons and some great talks, and we're now getting ready for a plenary semin- seminar with Mr. John DeBerry. And uh, I have really enjoyed getting to know Mr. DeBerry, have a lot of respect for him and his public service and the way that he brings together Christianity and public life. He's a very uh, big blessing to the state of Tennessee, and I'm so glad that he's here. Mr. DeBerry is a native of rural West Tennessee who served for 26 years as a state representative in the Tennessee House of Representatives. He currently serves as senior advisor to Tennessee Governor Bill Lee. He graduated from Freed Hardeman and also from the University of Memphis. He's a distinguished representative of the Tennessee House and has served in a number of, in, uh, he was a distinguished representative of the Tennessee House and he served in a number of influential roles, including Speaker Pro Tempore. His leadership has emphasized character and the values of the Christian tradition and has focused on education and mentoring young people. If you spend very much time with Mr. DeBerry downtown, you will see his dedication to youth, his emphasis on ministering and mentoring young people. I've seen it firsthand. So much of his public service has centered on youth and the importance of education. So for example, he served as a board member at Freed Hardeman University, co-chair of the Council of State Government Education and Workforce Development Public Policy Committee. He's also been a member of the Education Commission of the States, a member of the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth, and a regional officer with Youth for Understanding International Youth Exchange. He's also an ordained minister, and he served for many, many years as minister of the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ in Memphis. He was married to his late wife, Georgia, for 40 years. And they have two daughters, now grown, Javita and Victoria. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have John D. Berry with us this morning. Let's welcome him to the podium. Anytime those who believe in the Word of God, believe in the Son of God, believe in the sovereignty of God, get together and talk about issues that bring us together, issues that build our country, that strengthen our families, that help us in the rearing of our children, issues that make our country a better place, the type of place that it was envisioned to be when the forefathers and foremothers stood and sacrificed everything in order to bring it into being and fruition. And any time we get together, I think that it is a true blessing because there are those who want basically for us to disappear, for our voices to be muted, and for us to just go along to get along and refuse to do what we have been commanded to do and that is be a light and be sought in a world that is losing itself so rapidly that it's frightening. When I look upon the faces of those who believe in that old Bronze Age book called the Bible that folks say is irrelevant, that has absolutely no relevance in the debate, in the discussion today, And there are those of us who still believe that there was a God and is a God who formed man from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Rather than being the result of something that crawled from the primordial ooze and evolved and and that people go to the zoo to visit relatives, but basically... God formed us, breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. We became a living soul because God created man in his own image and in his own likeness. It is God that has made this world. Creation demands a creator. Design demands a designer. Life demands a life giver. And if there is order, there is authority and power behind that order. Someone said one time, Eureka, we have found it. 
we have found all of the makings and the parts and the ingredients and the powers of the universe. They said that we have discovered that in this universe, there is time, there is power, there is action, there is space, and there is matter. I remember from a physics class years and years ago, uh, having to answer a question that was similar to that statement. But don't you know, I can read what Moses wrote. When Moses wrote uh, in, as God revealed to him, those things which he had done thousands of years before Moses was born. I can go in the first verse of the Bible and show the sovereignty, the power, the authority of our God and our Father in heaven. The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father who plans all, God the Son who executes all, God the Holy Spirit who brings order out of chaos. And as I look at Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, time, God, force, power, created action, the heavens, space, and the earth. Right there in the first book, the first verse of the word of God, we have what the physicists and the scientists uh, found one day and said, Eureka, as though they had found something that was not known. Therein lies the arrogance of man. Therein lies the disobedience of man. Therein lies what we find so often in our society, in our culture, where we turn our back on those principles that were there at the beginning of this country. Those principles that were the foundation principles of who we are and what we are and what we claim to be. A long time ago, we find Solomon, who is often called the laboratory of human experience. Solomon understood something that is often misunderstood as men claim to have knowledge and authority beyond what God has given. Solomon said righteousness, righteousness, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach. That word reproach comes from a Hebrew term which means a shame. Sin is a shame, according to Solomon, to any people. In essence, where there is sin, then there is also shame, disgrace, perversion, disobedience, and transgression. It is a shame when we see what is happening all around us as the original righteous intent of the founders of this nation and of those men and women of all colors and hues and ethnicities and cultures fought together to make this the greatest country in the world. Jeremiah said one time, as he looked upon the faces of God's people, understanding this loss of righteousness, Jeremiah said and asked a question, which is a heart-penetrating question, which we as Americans must ask ourselves as we become desensitized, desensitized by those things that happen around us to where nothing seems to bother us anymore, no matter how ridiculous, how much it, excuse the expression, stinks in the nostrils of our God, our Father, and our Creator. Jeremiah asked the question, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Jeremiah said, no, no, they were not ashamed. Neither did they blush. We are rapidly becoming a culture, a nation, a society that has lost its ability to blush we have been so inundated and so uh, buried in all of these things of, of perversion and nudity and profanity that it is in everything that we look at, listen to, 
and everything we experience, it's infused in order to desensitize us and make us believe that that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. And too many of us who claim to believe in God's word and God is our creator have sat down on the seat of do nothing, leaned back on the elbows of do less, and said, wake me up when the battle is over. Well, when, if we do not find the temper and the guts and the ability and the strength to make a stand for what we claim to believe now, then we're going to lose it. The Apostle Paul said something in the book of Romans as he wrote to Rome in a book that's called the book that changed the world. The Apostle Paul said after beseeching them, begging them, imploring them to present themselves, their bodies, their mouth, their eyes, their hands, their feet, their thoughts, their talents, their abilities, their voice as a living sacrifice. Paul said in verses 2 of that chapter 12, he said, be not conformed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, Paul said. How, Paul? By the renewing of your mind, thinking different. Too many of us want things to change on the outside before we change things on the inside. And it is not until we as Americans began to change things on the inside to where we become that righteous nation again that sat on the hilltop that was a light and a guide and an example to the entire world that we're going to be again what we used to be and have the blessings that God has promised us. Too many folks have sold out, have sold out. They have decided that the things of this world are just a little bit more important than those things that the Lord has promised. Too many have decided on immediate gratification rather than delayed gratification. Too many have decided that the treasures on this earth are more valuable than the treasures that the Lord has promised. When the Lord sat down on that obscure hill and preached the greatest sermon that was ever preached, his longest discourse in his entire ministry, that short three-year but powerful ministry that changed the world. One of the things he said as recorded in Matthew's gospel in chapter 6, he said, lay not up, don't store up. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust that corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust that corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. He says, for where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. And America has got to ask itself, where is our heart? Where is our collective heart? Is our heart attuned to those things that are inspired of God? Or is it, are our hearts attuned to those things that come from man? There are too many folks in the landscape today, the political landscape, the corporate landscape, the academic landscape, the medical landscape. There are too many folks who are more impressed with themselves than they are with the Lord who is written in the scripture. Too many who are smiling, styling, and profiling their way through the landscape rather than standing for something that matters. And if America is going to reclaim its dignity and reclaim its position in the world as the influence of the world, then we've got to find again our God and our Father who was with the forefathers of this country when they decided to walk away at a time when there was tyranny, at a time when monarchies ruled the world, at a time when the Congo Wars were going on, 
and Africans were selling their own people into slavery at a time when the triangular trade was going on, there were some imperfect men, imperfect men who decided to create a more perfect union. Nobody claims that they were without their flaws and fears and failures and flops, but they had faith. And we are taught that we walk not by our own authority and vision, but we walk by faith and not by sight. Solomon is often called the laboratory of human experience because everything that could be had, could be owned, experienced, bought, every joy and pleasure of this world, Solomon had it all. But having been that laboratory of human experience, having had more money, more gold, more silver, more women, more pleasure than anybody before him or after him, he makes an assessment. And the assessment is very clear. And we as Americans need to listen to this man because of his experience and his assessments. Vanity, empty, shallow, vanity. No good, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. He says, I withheld nothing from my eyes. And at the end of the day, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he has to say, let's hear the conclusion. Let's draw the line. Let's look and see what was accomplished. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The apostle Paul, who was once Saul of Tarshish, and who but God could look in the heart of that murderous persecutor of Saul of Tarshish and see Paul the apostle. Who else but God could do that? But God had already promised that when he had already sent the prophet to Jesse's house to find a new king. Because Saul, like many of our politicians today, decided to go against the will of God and make an executive decision that does not go along with what God has commanded. God told Saul, I'm going to rend, I'm going to tear the kingdom from you. Lord have mercy. If God looks at us for another decade and decides to tear it away from us, those freedoms, those blessings that he has given us so freely that he would decide to tear them away from us because of the disobedience of those that we choose to lead. And God has already said, my people perish, they perish, they perish because of a lack of vision, the vision of those that lead. When the prophet got to Jesse's house, he says, this most certainly looks like a, a king because God says, I'm going to find me a better man than you, Saul, a better man. The old prophet said, this is a pretty boy. He would be a great king. Can you see him riding down the streets of Jerusalem in a Cadillac chariot in his Armani robe and four gummo sandals? Can't you see him do it? God said, I don't want him. He said, okay, here's another one as pretty as the other one. God said, don't want him either. Well, what about that one right there? God said, I don't want him either. I don't want any of your pretty boys that you choose. He says, I don't want that outward appearance that seems to impress you so much that you choose folks who have no substance, have no integrity, no principles, and most certainly do not obey my law. He says, man looks on the outward appearance. God says, I look at the heart. I look at the heart. I want to see what a person stands for, what he'll fight for, what he'll die for. That's what I'm looking for. And God sent him out and found David. Do you have any other boys? I've got one other boy. He's out there keeping the sheep and playing his guitar out there. And he went out there and there was David and he anointed David 
as the king. What is God saying to us? God is saying, you can't impress me. We've got so many folks want to talk about what we've got. Oh, we've got the greatest Navy in the world. We do. Oh, we got the greatest Air Force in the world. Absolutely. Oh, we got the greatest Coast Guard. We got our Marine Corps. We have our Space Force. We have our Army and probably seven, eight, nine other members of the military. Look at what we got. Problem is, we brag about all this stuff we got to fight with but we have forgotten what we fight for. We have walked away from God. And because of this, we see a change of our national psyche. We see a change in our national morality because there are those who don't have the guts to lead the way they're supposed to. General Dwight Eisenhower said one time, that the supreme quality for leadership is unquestionably integrity. Without it, no real success is possible, he said. No matter where, on a work crew, on a football field, in the army, in an office, he says there is no success without integrity. And so therefore, we see very clearly that much of the division that we see in this nation is because there are those who have walked away from our history, from our uh, traditional morality, and from our faith. In 1963, my family raised money so that my father could be within that crowd, that march that was in Washington, D.C. I knew he was somewhere in that sea of humanity, as we looked at the small screen TV, squinting, hoping to get a glimpse of him, knowing that we wouldn't, but it was fun looking to see if we saw him in that great mass of humanity, men and women, black and white, Jew, Gentile of all types, standing for what was right and the best of America. At that day, I can hear the speech of Dr. King. As he stood that day in front of the Lincoln Monument, I believe it was, and he talked about his various dreams. One that impressed me most, he said, I have a dream that one day that my little children would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. This dream by Dr. King is an American dream. This man was a patriot. He often spoke of the forefathers. He was not a man that wanted to destroy America, but a man that wanted to build America and call her to her promise. He said, and I quote, when citizens, or students rather, all over the South started setting in at lunch counters, I knew that as they were setting in, they were really standing up for the best of the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep, notice what he said, by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and within our Constitution. He often named the founding fathers because to him, as an American citizen, he reminds me of my father. My father was a Korean War era veteran, and he had a flag in his office. He had his uniform prominently displayed for us to see. When I went to Mrs. Riley's class, first grade, 1956, Don Avenue School, I remember standing beside that wooden desk and placing my hand over my heart and being proud to be one of the few children in the room who already knew the Pledge of Allegiance and stood that day and made that pledge that my father made us as children. It didn't matter that the nation at that time was segregated. It didn't matter at that time that we had our social issues and our social divisions. He called us to the fact that we were Americans protected by the Constitution and things will change. 
He says, we don't let circumstances change us. We change the circumstances. In 1968, when we integrated the schools in Crockett County, and I asked my father, what do we say when we go to this white school with these white children? Because we've been with black children our entire life. What do we do? What do we say? My father was eating his chicken and having his dinner, not paying me a whole lot of attention. My other five brothers and sisters are egging me on. Talk to the man. Talk to him. And, you know, and I said, Danny, what do we do when we go to that school? Danny finally stopped. He said, Nick, you go to school. He, that my, Nick is my nickname. He said, Nick, you go to school. He went back to eating his dinner. That didn't satisfy my brothers and sisters. They said, talk to the man. I talked to him, Daddy, what is it that we do when we go to this school? He said, Nick, you go to school. That's what you do. You go to school. And after asking him one more time, he laid his fork down, he laid his chicken down, and he looked me dead in my eye. And I can see it like it was yesterday. He said, Nick, you go to school. He said, you don't scratch your head when it ain't itching. You don't grin when it ain't funny. He said, you be a man. He said, you act like a man. You give respect, you will get respect. And that was our training for school integration. Guess what? Some of the best years in my life because there were other children who had been taught the same principles of life and we became friends, and even to this day, they visit me in my office at the Capitol from time to time. Why? Because I had someone who let me know that as an American citizen, not only did I have blessings, but I also had responsibility. That's something that has gotten lost at, in, in the, the time in which we live, it seems to have gotten lost, that these imperfect men wanted to build a perfect union. Within that preamble, we the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves. And notice this, to our posterity, our, poster, our children and grandchildren do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. What time do I stop? In 30 I got 30 more minutes. Oh, man. <laughs> I was one of those individuals. I was one of those who threw my hands up at a certain point. I had served several terms in the legislature. I had fought many battles. I had, had been trying to stop things and change things. We were in the constant battle to overturn Roe v. Wade and other encroachments on our freedom that were happening within the legislature. And it just got worse and worse and worse. My mother had, had marched and, and protested against abortion before she was killed in a car accident with my sister and brother in 1971. And for her, if I, the one blessing was, in 1973, she was not there to see the decision made that eventually took the life of over 60 million children, unborn children. And we all must under understand something, that as Americans, that we have a responsibility to stand for those things that are right. I was ready to throw up my hands. I was ready to quit. I was ready to say, I'm going home. I'm going to just take care of my family and wait on the end to come. And God got me real good. He put me in my place. You know what God did to me? He gave me grandchildren. And when those little, that little girl wrapped her hand around my finger and I looked in her eyes 
I said, okay, God, I got it. I got it. My job is to fight, to stand, and to do whatever possible to see to it that what I have been given that was fought for by men and women of all ethnicities and cultures in this nation to save this union, to save the world by the greatest generation, that I have a responsibility. Ronald Reagan says every generation has to pay the mortgage on freedom. And all of us from time to time have got to sacrifice. When the Apostle Paul was speaking to the brethren at Ephesus in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, Paul puts it in focus for those of us who think the church is supposed to just sit on the sideline that God's people are to have no voice. God's people are not to in any way insert themselves into the debate. Paul said to the brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand. Notice what Paul said against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles comes from a Greek term which means the devil is trying to figure you out. How do I compromise you? How do I tear your family apart? How do I make you derelict as a parent? How do I make you immoral and unfaithful in, to, in your marriage? How do I ruin you? That's his wiles. He wants to know your wiring. He wants to test your metal and see if you really stand for something. He said, stand against the wiles of the devil. Why are we standing, Paul? We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness where men sat in robes and made a decision that has taken the life of millions of babies because they decided that God's law, God's will and God's way was not important. Every one of us have to understand the alternatives of us not standing, speaking, fighting, of us allowing those things that are against what we believe to take charge of this nation. Dr. King made a quote years ago. During, this, during 1968, when the nation was about to destroy itself from the inside, he said to some folks and got a lot of criticism for saying it, he said, we may have all come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And as we lose the country, everybody loses. We lose our freedom, everybody loses. We lose our ability to worship as we please, our free speech to be able to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He said, we lose everything. Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first to say it. Jesus was the first to say it, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Don't you understand what has been happening to us? Our enemy said in the early 60s, we're going to take your country. We're going to take your country. Khrushchev, some of us who are older remember, he said, we're going to take your country. We're going to take it from you. And he said, we're going to take it without firing a shot. So you know how we're going to do it? We're going to divide you from within. We're going to make black folks hate white folks. White folks hate black folk. Poor folks hate rich folk. Rich folks hate poor folks. North hate the South. South hate the North. East hate the West. The haves, the have-nots, the educated and the illiterate. We're going to put you against yourself, and you're going to destroy yourself from within. Colin Powell said something in the middle of, of Desert Storm that had been quoted in several other wars before him. He said, the first casualty of war is the truth. That's the first casualty of war. 
the first casualty of war is the truth, which is why Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, in warning us of this spiritual warfare, he said, be sober, be sober, be vigilant, keep your eyes open. Because your adversary calls him by name the devil. As a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Lord have mercy, I didn't turn my ringer off. Seeking whom he may devour. In essence, your opponent, your opponent, your opponent is the devil. And the devil can't go to heaven. How do you be so stupid you get kicked out of heaven? You can go to heaven. He cannot go to heaven, and he don't want you to go. He's your opponent. So Peter said, be sober. Don't get drunk with pride. Don't get drunk with materialism. Don't get drunk with worldliness. Don't get drunk with your possessions. Don't get drunk with your degrees and with the things you've earned and the things that you've amassed in life. Don't get drunk with all of that stuff. You be sober. Paul said in Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12, he said, The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. What? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should be sober, live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where, Paul? In this present world. He gives us three principles that we've got to accomplish in our life before we leave this world. Soberly, your responsibility to yourself. Righteously, your responsibility to your brother. Godly, your responsibility to your creator. In essence, before you leave this world, you better learn how to keep yourself right, be right to those around you, and be right before your God and your Father in heaven. Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another. Someone say, wait a minute. Now, Moses said, love one another. Joshua said, love one another. The prophet said, love one another. That's not a new commandment. But Jesus said, you're not listening. You love one another as I have loved you. He says, it's not a new command. It's a new standard. It's not you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's not you give me something, I give you something. It's not you like me, I'll like you back. He says, no, I loved you when you were unlovable. I died for you. God commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners, still sinners. Jesus died for us. He says a new standard. I don't want to hear about your racial issues. I don't want to hear about your class issues. I don't want to hear about your social issues. I don't want to hear about all the stuff that you use to justify refusing to be like Jesus. He says, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. That's the, that's the commandment. That's the standard. And God says, I ain't changing it. God wants first place in your life, and that's the only place he's going to accept. God's not going to be relegated to some position as a microwave oven to where you get around to him when he don't violate your personal principles and personal mores and personal desires and your, all of our political and, and corporate and academic. I, the Lord says, listen. The bottom line is, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come unto the Father except by the way I tell him. So what is God saying to America? What God is saying to America is stop trying to redefine the word of God. Try, stop trying to redefine define the things that I have commanded you. This union was saved. Our nation rescued itself because of a strong moral and strong moral ethical leadership by men and women who knew where they were going, knew what they stood for, would not compromise, wouldn't allow their faults, their fears, their flops, their failures, their flaws, their fantasies, their familiarities to move them away from their faith. 
There are some things I can't choose, ladies and gentlemen. 1951, John Gaston Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee. That was a child born to John and Pearl D. Berry. On the birth certificate, it says John D. Berry Jr., colored. And it has the day of my birth. I didn't choose the color of my skin, my eyes, my hair, my physical makeup for as far as my DNA is concerned. And I didn't choose these things. Those are things that were chosen for me. But I choose if I have a positive or negative attitude. I choose if I'm a person who has a faith in God and a trust to walk and follow my faith. I choose to be a person who wants to imitate Jesus, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing. I'm going to do what God told me to do. I went to pick up my child who now has two master's degrees and is a therapist, a child therapist. But when she was about three years old, went to pick her up at Montessori School, and when she got in the car, my wife and I uh, turned and said, Christy, what in the world have you been doing? Because she smelled like nature. And, we, and I said, what have you been doing, Christy? Christy said, oh, it's okay, Daddy. Everybody in my class stinks. So, you know, how many folks in the world are just like that? Everybody stinks. Everybody's doing it. Everybody believes it. Everybody is walking in that fashion. Too many of us have that idea. I was coming in from Washington one time and flying over the Mississippi River. It is a meandering stream from one end of the country to the other end of the country. The Mississippi River flows. And you know what? The Mississippi River is crooked. It's crooked because water takes the path of least resistance. It goes around the obstacle rather than moving the I not know that erosion over a certain point of time, but water goes around the obstacle. So many of us have crooked lives. We have crooked politicians. We have crooked judges and crooked decision makers because they always take the path of least resistance rather than doing what is right. Someone wrote, when a group or tribunal has the power to censor our speech, regulate our thinking, demand our compliance, punish our defiance, prohibit our self-defense, suppress our vote and opinion, silence our voices, restrain or restrict our free will, we have already lost our liberty and forfeited our freedom and accepted tyranny. And that's what we see happening right now as we have changed the rules in America. It's happening more and more every day. It has been said that as Americans, our greatest treasure is our freedom and our will to defend it. In Proverbs 29 and verses 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Those who want to destroy this nation know that they've got to first destroy the family. To destroy the family, they destroy marriage. When they destroy marriage, they destroy the children. And eventually, we lose everything that's important because we change those things that God has ordained. In the face of political opposition the, and the majority who disagreed with him, Booker T. Washington said one time, it's character, not circumstances that make the man. Then he went on to say, a lie doesn't become the truth. Wrong doesn't become right. Evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. And what we see happening right now, 
is there are those who, because of political wrangling and political one-upsmanship, are changing the landscape, the mores, the culture, and the faith of many Americans. So I would hope and pray that on this day, as we take an introspective examination of ourselves and those things that we claim to believe, that we keep certain things in mind. Number one, children are about 25% of the population. That's an estimation. But they are 100% of the future. That's a declaration. That's definite. They are our ambassadors that we send to a time that we will not see. Someone said an eagle, our symbol of our freedom, has huge wingspan. I was watching some American eagles while I was up at Paris Landing a couple of weeks ago. And that huge bird that comes in and soars and lands in his nest high up on the mountain there. A raven will get right on the scruff of his neck, right in the back of him. A raven's a big bird with a huge paw. And he will put his paw in the back of that eagle's nest, neck and hold on tight. And he does it to aggravate the eagle just because he's not an eagle. And the eagle can spin and flop and do everything he can to shake that raven off. And he cannot shake the raven off because he's embedded within the feathers behind his neck. So at some point, the eagle spreads those huge wings that God gives him. And he flops and he soars and he soars higher and he soars higher and he soars higher and higher and higher and higher. And as he soars, at some point, the raven who's not, don't have the architecture of the eagle, he loses consciousness and he falls off the eagle's back. Because the eagle did not simply accept the aggravation, but he soared higher and higher because of it. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 31, But they that wait or depend upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk or move forward and not faint. Don't you understand that there will be those that are going to aggravate us and aggravate us and call us everything but a child of God. You're on the wrong side of history. Y'all are backwards. You're following that old Bronze Age book. But we've got to keep in mind that America is changing and we want to change it back. When you were born, I mentioned my birth date. I look like my parents, John and Pearl DeBerry. When I look at their picture, I can see my mother in my eyes. I can see my father in my nose and in my mouth <laughs> and in my hairline. <laughs> so when I was born, I looked like my parents. But as we get older, we look like our choices. And America used to look like its parents, its forefathers. But now we're beginning to look more and more and more like our choices. So there'll be those who'll tell you as I conclude, they'll say to us, stop calling, claiming that that old book is a standard of morality. Stop espousing the Hebrew scriptures as though they give an accurate account of man's origin. Stop opposing alternative lifestyles based on the writings of the Bible and denying your children those lifestyles. Stop defending your traditional views of marriage based on the teachings of the scriptures only. Stop denying your children access to alternative thinking and lifestyles, gender expressions, family structures, and perpetuating your exclusive beliefs. This is what the devil wants us to do. Just quit, just quit, just quit. We've wondered 
it's time for us to return for righteous, to righteousness. Those of us who believe, time to take lead so that America returns to righteousness. It's time that we as a people forgive ourselves of our past faults and flaws and failures and fears. Let's return to righteousness, live our faith, restore justice, and move on. It's time for us to release the bitter pill of eternal shame, self-pity, apprehension, accept the healing potion of self-acceptance, self-esteem as Americans, self-awareness, self-appreciation as a country, return to righteousness and move on. It's time to cease and reject the self debasing songs and rhetoric of beat down, defeated victims, and as Americans, lift up the heroic anthems and affirmations of victors, overcomers, by the grace of God, return to righteousness and move on. It's time to stop groveling in the murky mire and, the, and sinking into the bottomless pit of racial, ethnic, cultural, national conflict, finger-pointing, blame, and divisiveness. Climb out of the pit of shame, America. Walk upright on the firm ground of consensus, camaraderie, brotherhood, and faith. Let's embrace our common beliefs, our common faith, our common goals, our common dreams. Return to righteousness and move on. It's time that we, the people, and we as a people, stop reliving our yesterdays, discounting and devaluing our present days, subverting and undermining our future days. It's time to be thankful, live, learn, love, return to righteousness, and move on. Finally, it's time that we as Americans realize that our strength resides in the collective faith and the righteous might of we, the people. Our government, therefore, must give us what we deserve to succeed protect and enforce the Constitution, get out of our way so we can move on. We cannot unwrite history. We cannot rewrite history. All we can do is learn from history and write a better future for this country. It's up to you guys. It's up to you guys. It's up to you guys, you young folks. We've done our part, fought our battles, win, lose, good, bad. It's up to you guys. Do better than we did. Thank you. <laughs>